I arrived in Ecuador on January 4th, 2011. I actually remember that date very specifically, apparently. Um, one, because I have been told by my trainer I was her birthday present because her birthday was the day before. So I always connect those two in my mind. Um, the first day in the mission. Uh, so, okay, so we left Peru. We got, I think we flew into, I was very grateful I wasn't by myself. I had a com I had my companion, Hermana Flores, um, with me. And so we, both of us were kind of talking about like, oh, what to, what's today going to be like? Um, or how different is per Ecuador going to be than Peru? Because we were in Peru for six weeks. Um, and so I remember we got to, we flew into Quito, flew into the airport. And there were a total of four missionaries on our plane um, who were coming to the mission. It was me and Armando Flores, and then there were two elders. Um, and we got to the airport, and we went through customs. Um, and I felt like I was a pro because I had gone through customs in Peru. So <laughs> I was like, oh, Quito, no big deal. I can do this. Um, so we got to the airport, and we went and picked up our bags. And then um, my mission president and his wife, so president and sister Sloan, were there um, along with the assistants to pick us up. And um, I remember being so excited to see somebody <laughs> who was a missionary. Um, and um, I was very, very excited to see them and to meet them. Um, and so they picked us up and we all got in... Um, they had a snack for us. I don't remember what it was, but they had, I don't know, like a juice box and something. And so we all got on into this van. Um, they put all of our bags in there and then we all got in the van. And then my mission president, so president and sister Sloan were driving in a, they were driving in their own personal car. So they were in a separate vehicle, but then all the missionaries, we were together. <clears throat> and so as we were in the van going, um, the assistants were like, okay, so we're going to go up to the mission home um, just so that we can meet up again with President Sister Sloan. Um, and they're going to probably jump in this van because we were such a small group. <laughs> and then and they're like, and then we're going to go somewhere special in Quito. And that's all we knew. We didn't know anything beyond that. Um, and we're like, oh, okay. And, and so they were like, do you have any questions? And all of us were kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to ask. Um, and I remember it wasn't, Hermana Flores was the first person. So she was like, uh, who's our trainers? Like, that's all she really wanted to know. Who's our first companions going to be? And the assistants were like, we're not going to tell you who has who. Um, but they just told us their names. And so I don't remember who it was for the elders, but um, for the sisters, all that we got told was Hermana Bojorge and Hermana, Hermana Cooper. And so from their names, we could pretty much assume one of them is a Spanish speaker and one of them is an English speaker. Um, and, and so we're like, oh, okay. So both of us were trying to figure out who was gonna get who, um, but we didn't really think about it much. And so we, met, we got back up, we got to the mission home and President and Sister Sloan jumped in the van with us. And then we continued on our way. And we got told um, we were going to a hill in Quito um, that has on top of it um, uh, a statue of, um, I guess technically it's the Virgin, but um, it's called the Panaceo. And um, and like, and we'll explain more once we get up there, because we're like, okay, we're like, there's a statue up there. That's all we know. Um, so we got up there, and as we were getting there, um, Sister Sloan asked us. She was like, you guys have umbrellas, and we're like, uh, I was like, in my suitcase, but it's kind of buried. So like, thankfully they had extra umbrellas, um, because they warned us that there was probably a high chance it was going to rain. So we're like, okay. And so we got out of the van. We all had umbrellas, and the second we got out of the van. We hear this clap. No, we had walked down to where the, the statue was and we'd sat down. And as soon as we sat down, we heard this huge clap of thunder. And we're like, oh, no. And then it's two seconds later. Whoosh, it was just downpour. Um, so me and Armando Flores were sharing an umbrella, trying to stay dry. 
Um, I think the elders sadly didn't have an umbrella, so they were getting soaked. Um, and then the two assistants, President Sloan and his wife, so the four of them were trying to share one umbrella to stay dry. And they were reading this paper um, to us. And the the significance behind this um, behind this hill is where the land was dedicated for proselytes, like the the preaching of the gospel in Ecuador. And so it's a special place for for the church. Um, and so they were reading like the prayer that got said, um, but obviously we're all getting soaked. And so um, they eventually decided that it wasn't worth us to sit there and get completely wet, which was too late because we were already completely wet, um, to continue getting wet and continue to be freezing because it was probably about 50 degrees outside. Um, not to mention we are now wet, so <laughs> made it even worse. Um, so we ended up getting back in the van and we just went back to the mission home instead of staying up there. Normally they'd stay up there and they'd take pictures and, um, and whatnot. And so we went back to the mission home and so we all got there and we were all soaking wet, but we were really happy to be inside where it was dry. And, um, remember right when we got in there, um, President Sloan was like, Hey, um, I want each of you to go on the computer. He's like, you get, you get a max of like five minutes. He's like, I just want you to send an email to your parents and letting them know that you made it safe and sound to Ecuador. And I was like, okay. Um, and so there was no like reading the other emails. It was purely get on, send an email. I'm safe. I'm healthy. I'm in Ecuador. I'll talk to you on P day, which is like six, seven days away. <laughs> um, and so each of us took our turns and we did that. And, um, and then we were sitting there waiting and um, other missionaries slowly started showing up. So the first two missionaries show up um, were sisters actually. Um, it was this, the mission nurse and her companion. Um, and so we started talking with them uh, and not knowing who anybody was. And then elders showed up um, and then another, a trio, I was like, wait, yeah, a trio of sisters showed up. And, um, and I was like, okay. So then we kind of introduced ourselves to each other. Um, and we got, I got told afterwards that my companion, my trainer already knew who she was getting, but she couldn't tell us cause she had to wait. That was for president Sloan to tell us and not them. And so they were all just sitting there talking with us. Um, and so the, this trio that walked in, it was Armana Cooper, Armana Castellani and Armana Bojorge. Um, and so right off the bat, me and, and Armana Flores who'd come together, we recognized Armana Cooper and Armana Bojorge and we're like, okay, obviously those are our trainers, but we don't know who's getting who. Um, and so then we had a pizza party <laughs> and had dinner and we were all starving. So it was good to have pizza and it was Papa John's pizza. And I didn't think I would see Papa John's pizza in Ecuador, but you know, I did. Um, and then, um, and then we got pulled in individually to have a, our first interview with the mission president. And I still remember to this day that walking in and talking with president Sloan for the first time, um, by myself and, um, and his question was, why did you serve? Why did you decide to serve a mission? And I sat there and kind of pondered for a while and, um, kind of gave him my life story about what happened with my family and, um, and, and my trials that I had had of kind of going away from the church, but coming back. And I think that whole experience of leaving and coming back, realizing what I, what I was leaving behind when I wasn't involved in the church kind of had a big deal in making me, um, helping me decide to serve a mission. And, um, and so as I was thinking and trying to figure it out, the, the answer that came to my mind and the basic one was that I love my Lord and my Savior Jesus Christ and I want others to know Him and I want other people to um, 
receive the blessings and um, that that the church provides, that the gospel provides in in my life, and that they can receive the same blessings. And um, and we talked for a little bit more. I don't remember all of it, but I remember that part. And and so then he he thanked me, and he was very grateful. And he's um, he was like, I'm happy. And I, that you're here in the Quito mission, and I know you're supposed to be here. Um, and that, that there are many people in this, in this country, um, be it your companions, be it members of the church already, be it people on the street, that you are meant to meet, and you are meant to serve, and you are meant to love, um, and have a relationship with. And I remember bawling at that moment, but that's okay. And so he thanked me for my time, and um, and then he asked me to send in another missionary. And so I left. And so I went out, and I was just can um, a few minutes later, he came out, and then he asked us all to come together. And so we had it was a small group of us, um, and so he had we kind of had a little devotional thing, and um, he talked about different types of missionaries, um, four um, different types of missionaries, the happy missionaries, the going through the motion missionaries, um, sad missionaries. I don't remember the last one, but he had facial expressions to go with each of them. And I remember there was four and, um, he, he always, he was like, there's going to be days that you will be the sad missionary. There's going to be days you'll be the frustrated missionary because, you're going to get a hundred doors slammed in your face and nothing's going to come out of it. And after all the like negative, negative aspects, I was like, Oh great. Feeling great about this. Um, he's like, however, there's always hope. And, and he's like, and deep down, remember who you're serving and remember why you're here. And he's like, even though you'll have those sad days and those sad moments and those frustrating moments, um, he was like, remember to be happy and, because that's going to be shown through your countenance and your actions um, and and your spirit, and other people will feel that. And so he continued, and he was, um, and then he was like, "Well, now it's time to tell everybody who your trainers are." Um, the main thing that everybody was like anticipating, and so um, I remember. I think Armana Flores was first, and she was with Armana Bojorge. And then he went to the elders, and each of them got theirs. Um, and then he was like, and Armana Reed, you are very, very, very special. And I was like, okay. Um, he was like, because you don't only get one trainer. You're getting, in essence, two trainers. And I was like, okay. So um, he's like, and you're with Armana Cooper and Armana Castellani, and you're going to be serving in Calderon. And, um, and I remember turning and I was like so excited. Um, and I gave both Armana Cooper and Armana Castellani a big hug. Um, and shortly after this, we all kind of separated. Um, we took a picture in the mission home of all of us together, um, before we all separated and went our, went to our own areas. Um, my area was only by bus about an hour away. Um, by taxi, probably about 40 minutes away, roughly. Um, and so we left the, the mission home and, um, each of my companions had one of my big bags <laughs> and I had my carry on and then my backpack and walking down the street and, um, walking down to the corner to, to try to grab a, call a taxi so that we could go back to our area and, um, I remember there was this lady, she was drunk, <laughs> um, on the corner and she was kind of yelling and saying, I have no idea what she was saying. Cause I didn't speak Spanish at the time. And all that I knew was she was yelling and I could tell that she probably was intoxicated or under the influence of something. And so my two wonderful companions kept kind of pulling me and putting me on like the other side of them away from her and um we'd finally called the taxi and we were about to uh to get in it and um this lady started just going ballistic and i was like 
what's going on? Um, and she started going crazy. And then there is another taxi that pulled up. And so some, a guy got out and started yelling at the lady. I just remember that factor. And all of a sudden she was like, Oh, you guys should take this taxi, um, to us. And, and we're like, no, 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 you just take the taxi. It's fine. We'll take the one that's right behind it. And she was like, Oh, okay. So she got in the taxi, she left and we got in the taxi and, um, we were on our way to Calderon to my very first area. And, um, the first few minutes of the, of the taxi ride, um, Hermana Cooper apologized to Hermana Castellani and was like, can I talk to Hermana Reed in Spanish or in English for a second? And she was like, oh yeah, that's fine. And so she just kind of talked to me for a few seconds, just kind of being like, are you okay? Like what's going on? How are you feeling? Type of a deal. And, um, and that lasted about 30 seconds literally um because then it was okay now we're gonna start talking to the taxi driver and i was like wait what um and so they started talking with the taxi driver and um i think armana castellani started and then armana cooper said something and then they looked at me because they're like now it's your turn and i was like uh <laughs> okay i don't even remember what i asked him but i think it was something to do with his family probably um because i had kind of registered a couple words that I had heard when they were talking and um and so we started talking to the taxi driver and um I mean we had a good 40 minutes in the car with him so we're gonna take advantage of those 40 minutes um that was my very first lesson in the mission field that was to not pass up a single opportunity um to talk to people and to share a thought with them or or anything and um and I remember once we started talking to him about his family and he had a couple kids um so we focused on that and so we started talking about the family and the importance of the family and um I remember once we got to our apartment complex before we got out of the car um we invited him to come to church and we gave him a pamphlet I don't remember what pamphlet we gave him but we gave him one of the pamphlets um, and and we we invited him to come to church and we explained to him that even if you don't live in our area, there's churches throughout the, the greater Quito area um, that you can easily find one. And the, there was a phone number and we're like, call this number and um, they can help you find the closest church building of yours. Um, and so we got into my our apartment and... Um, they were like, Hermana Reed, this is your room. Cause, so we were in a trio. So the, our apartment had three different bedrooms. So it had a big like living room area. It was really open. <laughs> um, a, a teeny tiny kitchen. Um, not as tiny as the bathroom. The bathroom was even smaller. And then there were there was two bedrooms. There was three different bedrooms. And so the one bedroom had all three beds in it. Because obviously we're all in the same room. So all of our beds were in that one room. And then because we had three different bedrooms, each of us had um, our own closet space. So Armana Cooper had a closet space, Armana Castellani had a closet space, and so did I. And so we're like, here's yours. And they're like, just put your, start putting your stuff away, um, and then we'll take it from there. And I was like, okay. And so as we, I started putting all my stuff in my closet and trying to figure out where to put things. Um, I remember Armana Cooper came in. And she was like, hey, do you have your bedding? And I was like, sure. So I grabbed my my sheets for her. And um, she was like, we'll make your bed for you. And I was like, okay, thanks. That's great. So they went and they made my bed. And then I finished putting my stuff away. Um, and we kind of did some planning. And I was really lost because I had no idea of what we were doing, who we were seeing, or any of the above. Um, and... That that was the very first day in Ecuador, um, but the first day, like actually in the field, the following day. So I got up in the morning, and um, we got ready. And I'll just tell you now, being in a trio is not easy um, because one, it's already hard enough to have two people getting ready, but to have that third person, it totally 
changes and it, it affects the timing of everything. Um, you have to manage it even more so. And um, so we each got up, we each of us took a shower. I want to say Armana Cooper cu cooked breakfast while we were all, while the rest of us were getting ready. Um, and so we had breakfast and then we had study time. And um, I don't even remember what I studied that day, but I studied something. Um, how to preach my gospel is probably the first lesson, I'm assuming. Um, and, um, and then we had our companionship study. And um, I remember both of them going off on what all they had learned, and it was really cool. And and then we tried to pull it into what the plan for the day was. Um, and we had certain lessons we were going to teach that day. And so um, we kind of figured out, okay, this is the lesson. And then between Hermana Castellani and Hermana Cooper, um, they were trying to help me to know who these people were that we were going to teach because I obviously hadn't met them yet. And so they were trying to just kind of give me a, a way to be able to know who they are um, and kind of their background. And so we did that and then we had language study for another hour. And so we, and then we took off for the day, but before we left, we, I remember we said a prayer. Um, actually we did that every day, but we, we'd always say our prayers, uh, a prayer before we left. Um, the apartment. So we left our apartment complex and we started walking down the hill. I don't remember who we were going to see, but we were going to see somebody. And um, there were multiple people out on the sidewalk and there were people walking towards us. And so Hermana Cooper leaned over to me and she's like, remember what I said, we're not passing up an opportunity to talk to people. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and so as we approached these people, she was like, Hermana Reed, you're gonna do it. And I was like, okay. And as we were getting closer and closer and I was just like, I don't know what to say. And so, <laughs> Um, we were in the process of almost passing them and Armana Cooper just jumped in and so she started talking to them. And so we left, like we, we just did a contact with them and continued on our way and, um, and she's like, the next one's yours. And I was like, okay. And mind you, this was a pattern for the entire time that I was with her. Um, we kind of just flip flop, um, taking turns of making the initial contact. So the next group of people came up and I'm sure I sounded really ridiculous, but I tried my best and was like, said hello <laughs> um, and, ex and said who we were, or at least attempted to say who we were, um, that we were missionaries for the church in my very broken Spanish at the time. And, um, and I don't even remember what they said to me. Um, and I was like lost. And so I was so grateful that my two companions were there and they were willing to take my back um and so they started talking to her and so talking to them and so that just kind of continued throughout the day in between all of our appointments um I remember when we went to I don't remember whose house we went to for lunch but I remember our first my first lunch in the mission um and it was only the beginning of many lunches that would be very similar. Um, but we we got fed by missionary or by members of, of our ward, and so um, we went to the sister's house. And be this the first day or not, this is the first meal I remember. So um, she puts down the plate in front of her. We got a bowl of soup. That was our first thing. Get a bowl of soup. And then after you finish your soup, then we get um, the main meal or main plate, which a normal plate size, and there would be like a pretty good mountain of rice on it. And then I think there was some sort of meat. Um, there was sliced up avocados, which I don't really like avocados, so that was, that was a fun experience. Um, and then the salad, what did we have? Um, we had beet salad, so it was boiled beets cubed up and mixed together with mayo, and that was what my first lunch was. And then um, a small glass of some sort of juice. I don't remember what juice it was, but it was a juice. And so I had to not think about what I was eating um, and just dive in and eat it um, because 
I knew there was going to be lots of things that I didn't want to eat and that things that I knew I didn't like, but I would have to eat them because I'm a missionary and it has always been my thing. And especially as a missionary, but not only that, even if I'm at a friend's house and I get fed, get, I'm given something, um, I'm going to eat what they give me, be it I like it or not, um, just because of courtesy aspects and manners. Um, and so we finished eating. We continued on our way. Um, we had many lessons that day. I don't, I mean, multiple lessons. And I remember being lost in almost every single lesson. And that actually just continued for the next, for sure, for the next week, I was always lost in, in the lessons. Um, and um, it was already hard trying to teach with three of us instead of just two people. Um, but my companions, they would say something and then the next person would say something and then they'd look at me and I'd be like, I don't know what they said, but I'll just testify what they said because that's what I know I can say. Um, and, and so that kind of continued for, for a while. But um, I don't think there's a way to really describe the first day in the mission field. One, it's different for every single person. Um, but two... It is most definitely one of the most eye-opening moments um, of the of the whole time, and um, I remember that night I was so ready for bed. <laughs> my brain hurt, my head hurt, my body hurt. I was tired, like I've never been tired before, um, and I know a lot of it was because I had to try to concentrate and in a different language and trying to figure out what was going on and following conversation and trying to figure out how to say things um, and whatnot. That all just kind of added all onto each other, let alone I'd been outside and walking around for who knows how many hours that day. Um, so let's just say I was ready for bed when bed bedtime came. Um, but that after about the first week, I kind of got into the swing of things and was used to walking around and my brain still hurt a lot um, just because of the language aspect and trying to learn it and trying to follow conversation and um, being able to to speak and teach um, the people that we were contacting and, and teaching. Um, I remember <laughs> I remember the first actually there was two really crazy experiences. Um, one, I was very grateful for, for Hermana Cooper. Um, she, I remember one of our lessons, um, because everybody knew that she spoke English. Um, I remember one of our lessons, we were teaching this lady, um, and I don't remember what we were talking about. We were talking about something and I was trying to formulate and trying to figure out how to say something. Um, and so I was sitting there and I was trying to think about it. And and so the, this lady that we were teaching, she turned to my companion and was like, how about, or she, she looked at me and she's like, how about you just tell your companion in English and she'll translate it in Spanish. And as much in the back of my mind, I was like, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> um, but my wonderful companion um, was like, no, that's not gonna happen. Hermana Reed is here to teach um, in your guys in your native tongue, and that is Spanish, and meaning she has to learn it. And if that means we have to sit here for five minutes while she formulates in her brain what she's going to say, then that's what we're going to do. And I remember being very frustrated in that very moment that I was like, oh, why, why did you have to do that? But um, it was actually a very pivotal moment of, of my very first area. Um, because one, I could have easily, she could have easily just been like, yeah, that's not a problem. But instead she focused on the purpose and the reasons that we were here. And she knew that I needed to be able to teach in that moment and that I needed to have that experience and that learning. Um, and looking back, I'm very grateful for that. Um, and about, I don't know, three weeks after that experience, I want to say, um, 
was we were teaching a, a mom and a daughter that we had ran into um, like the second week of my mission or of my time in the area. And um, we were over at their house and we, we were teaching them and um, they had come to church a couple times and so we were trying to figure out what was going on because they had all of a sudden kind of disappeared. And um, so we were trying to figure out what was happening and why they didn't want to come to church and stuff like that. And I remember sitting there and I was just listening to what they were saying. And my companions, um, they were each teaching and, te and, and whatnot and sharing their testimonies. And all of a sudden I just opened my mouth and I couldn't tell you what I said, but um, I remember I just started saying many things, <laughs> but m m mainly like my testimony and, and the importance of church and um, and having the courage to overcome the obstacles and the fears that we have as humans. And um, I remember something about those gists and I, remember afterwards thinking about it and I was like I have no idea where half of that came from because many of them were words that I didn't even or at least didn't think that I knew <laughs> um and all that I, I had I had figured it out in my head and I was saying it in English and I was like this is what I want to say and I remember just kind of repeating and being like this is what I want to say and um that was probably my first real experience um of, I guess you could say truly teaching by the Spirit, but more specifically um, having the gift of tongues um, and and having it truly be, it wasn't me teaching um, and it was purely, Heavenly Father, I need to get to them and I'm going to open my mouth and I'm going to trust you that what needs to be said is going to be said right now. And um, I remember they were completely speechless. <laughs> everybody, including my companions. Um, and we kind of sat there in silence for a few minutes or for, for probably a minute or two. And, and then both of, both of my companions were like, yeah. And they just kind of kept it going from there. Um, and I want to say they came to church the next week and then they kind of disappeared again, but we, we tried. Um, that's all we could do. Um, but I remember we were on our way back to our apartment and my, my companion turned and she just looked at me and she had the biggest smile on her face. And she was like, I was waiting for that moment. <laughs> I was like, what? And she's like, I was waiting for that moment when you would just open your mouth and the words would just come and, and have you not be thinking about it and have you not be freaking out about it, but just teaching. Um, and she's like, I have been waiting. And, um, all of us, that was a big testimony building moment um, for all three of us as a whole, but um, that was one of my, I don't know, coolest experiences, I guess you could say, um, at least out of my first area. Um, and that wasn't my first week, but <laughs> but it, it really, I don't know, there's, yeah. The food, um, be forewarned, you will eat a lot of plain white rice like plain white rice. Um, I never thought I would eat so much rice in my life, but, um, I did. Um, you get a lot of white rice. It's like the main thing. And then you get some sort of meat, typically, um, a type of salad. Um, so just be prepared for that and be prepared to be very, very full <laughs> after you're done eating lunch. Um, because you get fed a lot, and so, um, and especially rice is very filling, so it, it fills you up pretty quick. Um, don't hesitate to talk with the members, though, um, even in regards to, especially if you have food restrictions, um, I wouldn't necessarily be like, oh, I don't like this, so don't give it to me. I, I do not recommend doing that. Um, However, if there are certain things you can't eat because of dietary needs, don't hesitate to tell them um, because they're wanting to serve you too and um, they're going out of their way to give you food. Um, and if, if they're aware, then they, they can 
they can work with you. Um, I had a companion who couldn't really eat rice, and so she had to have that conversation with all the, all the sisters um, when they fed us. Um, and so usually she would get, they sometimes they'd give her bread instead of rice to kind of balance out um, not having um, that staple. Um, or I had a couple companions, or I had a companion, for example, who she, she could eat rice, rice wasn't a problem, but she couldn't eat huge amounts of rice. And so she was able to talk to the sisters and just ask them if they could give her less rice and they were fine with that too. Um, and be excited for all the fruit juices because that's probably outside of people. Um, when people, when, when I get asked, what do I miss the most about Ecuador? Um, besides the many people that I came in contact with, obviously, my first answer is always the fruit, um, and the juice. They eat lots of fruit and they, um, you almost always have fresh juice with your, with your meals. Um, and, um, be prepared to eat lots of bananas. Um, that's a, that's a big one. And if you've never realized that there's more than two types of bananas, then you are in for an eye-opening experience. Um, they're just in, like in Ecuador by itself, there's probably at least 15 types of bananas. They all have different names. They all get used in different ways. Um, my all-time favorite banana most definitely is the red banana, and it is legitimately red. Um, and it it has a sweeter, it has a different taste. It's sweeter. Um, I can't really describe it, but that um, was one of my favorite fruit from down there. Um, in addition to many other kinds of fruit. Um, and take advantage of them. Um, there's a lot of crazy fruit, so I would recommend like documenting the crazy fruit that you eat. Um, like I have pictures of some of the fruit because it's not stuff you can get here. And so I like to show my family and be like, this is what I ate. Um, and they all look at me like I'm crazy, but it was good. During Easter, so the week of Easter, the food is, is a little special. Um, how do I describe this? Um, depending on where you are, you may or may not get meat that week. You might get a lot of fish, so just be prepared. Um, and when you get fish in Ecuador, you get the entire fish. Um, they Sometimes you're lucky and they gut them, but more often than not, they don't get gutted and they don't really get cleaned. They get rolled in flour and they get fried. And so they'll hand you a plate and it's the entire fish and the eye and they're like looking at you and it's kind of creepy. Um, but it's actually really good. It's just different. Um, and then on Easter, they have a special soup that they make, and it's called finesca. Um, I only had it once while I was there, um, but it's a soup made from how many? It's all from it's all grains, and so there's like eleven different grains I think um, that are in this soup, and so it's a very very heavy and thick soup. Um, and they quite often put um, smoked fish in it too. Um, so just be forewarned. Um, it's really good though. I, well, I thought it was really good. Some people don't think it's good, but I thought it was good. Um, just know that it's really heavy <laughs> and hopefully you don't get it multiple times during the week of Easter because it will do damage to you. Um, that's probably what I'd have to say in regards to food. Um, I'm actually very grateful that I knew somebody who served in my mission before I went to my mission um, because she gave me tips before I left and I took them seriously and I'm very grateful that I did. <laughs> probably the biggest tip that I have for the Quito mission, be it Quito South or Quito North, like regardless, um, I would say get a very good umbrella and bring it like from here. Um, they have umbrellas down there, but you'll probably go through many if you buy them down there. Um, all my companions who bought their umbrellas in Ecuador probably, I mean, even within a two transfer time together, 
I had at least two companions that had to buy two or three umbrellas during that time. Um, in Quito itself, um, it rains almost like clockwork. You can almost guarantee either rain or hail um, every afternoon. Um, I learned that from my very first day in the mission. When we got there, it was about two o'clock and thunderstorm rolled through um, because you're at the top, you're up in the Andes Mountains. Um, and so I don't think there were very many days, at least in Quito, that I didn't see rain. Um, and so that would be my number one thing, would be to bring a very good umbrella. Um, and not a huge umbrella, just one of the small ones. Um, a good idea also, I didn't have very many and I wish I would have had more. Thankfully I had companions who had many, but cardigans are also really good. Um, cardigans are really, are really, really good because um, in Ecuador, at least I served in the mountains my whole time. And um, on average during the day, it was probably in the 60s, upper 50s, 60s, lower 70s um, year round. And that was during the day. And obviously you're out and you're out for the entire day. And so there were many times where I wouldn't actually have a, a coat or a jacket with me, um, but I would just have... I actually learned it from my companions. I would just carry a small, a light cardigan with me um, and, a, and a scarf. Those were like my two, I guess my three essentials would be cardigan, scarves, and an umbrella. Um, those were the three things that I always had um, because there were many times where all I needed to do in the evening once it started getting cold, I'd throw on my cardigan, I'd throw on my scarf, and I would be fine. I wouldn't need anything more than that. Um, sometimes during the actual winter time, I might have a pair of gloves in my backpack um, just to keep my hands warm. Um, but overall, those were like my three go-to things outside of obviously carrying my scriptures um, and copies of the Book of Mormon with me to give to people. Um, backpacks are always really good. Um, sunblock lots of sunblock um I wasn't very good at wearing sunblock <laughs> and I paid for it um I was almost always burnt um especially on my scalp um the you don't think about it a lot because it's not overly warm um at least not in the mountains I know out in the Amazon it gets warm and out on the coast it uh, gets very warm and humid in both of those areas um but because you're on the equator, you're so much closer to the sun. And so even though it's not necessarily hot outside, the sun is out and the sun is a lot stronger because you're closer to it. And um, I don't think there was a time I was not sunburned over the whole course of my 18 months. Um, and all my companions would always make a comment about the fact that I wasn't wearing sunscreen. So <laughs> take sunscreen, lots of sunscreen. Um, another one would be, and I know a lot of, I mean, a lot of foreign countries, this is just a good idea and tip. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about taking 18 months worth of shampoo and conditioner. However, if you are a contact wearing sister or missionary period, um, I would take 18 months worth of contact solution. I didn't have contacts on my mission, um, but I did have companions who did, and they all told me the same thing, um, to take lots of that. Um, and obviously 18 months of feminine hygiene products is a good idea too. Um, you can get them there, but they're a lot more expensive. So um, I would recommend not doing so. Um, I've heard good things about buying in bulk from Costco, so there's an option for you. Um, also, makeup, um, take 18 months worth of makeup, um, just a tube of mascara in Ecuador is about $18, um, so that's just to give you an idea. Um, so I would take a whole mission's worth of that. Safety tips. Um, first and foremost, follow the guidelines in the missionary handbook. Um, 
honestly, if you're obedient and you follow those, you're going to be protected because you're being obedient. Um, but also, I mean, be, be aware, be aware of your surroundings. Most definitely. Um, not only that, don't ignore any feeling that you might have from the spirit. Um, I actually have an example of this when my very first area, we had met up with a family. Um, and it was at this time I was only with my trainer. So there was just the two of us and we met up with a family and we'd given them a lesson and we were leaving and we were going to go one direction, um, because it was shorter to get back. Um, rather than going the other direction, which would have added a good 10, 15 minutes onto our travel time. And so we left in all purpose intention to go this direction. And as we came around the corner, I kind of had this feeling, but apparently she had the exact same feeling. Um, cause both of us come kind of at the exact same time, we kind of glanced at each other and it was a, at, we shouldn't go this direction. Um, and we, and instead of ignoring that, we listened to that and we just turned around and we walked the other way. So even though it added 20 minutes to our time, um, we, we knew that we, we, it was better to take a longer route than to take a risky route. Um, and so I, those would be my biggest safety tips. Um, if you're on the bus or the Metro, um, Never put your backpacks on the ground or up above, like in the loft or in the bag holding area. Um, if you're sitting, have it on your lap and have your arms around it. Um, and if you are not, not able to sit, which is a very common thing, usually you have to stand, stand um, still pull it in front of you and have it in front of you and have your arm around it, um, especially where the zippers are and where they connect, like where they open. Um, because if your hand's there, then it's less likely. There's a lot of pit, po pit pick pocketing um, that happens on the trains and on the buses. And so it's not a good feeling when that happens because I did have that happen to me. So that would be my biggest safety tips. I have a story, but well, I have multiple miracles on my mission, but there's one miracle story that kind of stands out more than another in my, when I think about it. Um, and it's, um, it's a very, very dear, special person to me. Um, her name's Sophia and she goes by Sophie. <laughs> um, we came in contact with her. It was in my last area of Rio Bamba and I don't even remember how we first came in contact with her. Um, I want to say we either found her name in our area book or somebody the elders might have actually given us her name, but that's besides the point. Um, we met, so we met up with this, with this girl and her family, her parents. Um, and she, she is one of the very, one of many people who are very special to me from my mission. Um, she's, she's restricted to, to a wheelchair. She has multiple, um, health issues. Um, and when we met her, um, she has a very special spirit about her. The very moment I met her, I knew there was something special about her. And, um, and we, and we got to know her a little bit. And as we got to know her, um, this probably would have been March or April, I want to say of, of 2012. Um, and so as we got to know her, she's like, yeah, I know many missionaries. And we're like, wait, what? Um, and we found out that she had first come in contact with missionaries, sisters, actually, um, about 12, 10, 12 years prior to us. And she, her and her family had been taught on and off, um, during those years. And, um, and she, already had a copy of the Book of Mormon. She's read it many times. Um, you could tell she had a testimony of it, um, but she, she didn't want to get baptized. And, um, I taught her the whole, the whole last like two months of my time in that area. And, um, 
every time we brought up baptism, she'd always be like, nope, don't want it. And so we'd kind of let it go and we just kind of keep teaching her um, and prayed nonstop for her. Um, and I remember after I came home from my mission, so I came home in May of 2012, um, and she had found me on Facebook probably like before I even left, but um, obviously I hadn't been on Facebook. So I didn't know until I got home, but I had a friend request from her. And um, and so from the moment I got home, I was talking with her. She's on Facebook a lot and, um, and whatnot. And so she always posted pictures. And so um, there was a picture of my companion and who my last companion before I left with her new companion. And then a little while later it'd be other missionaries. Um, and so she got taught on and off for, for a while after my mission or after I got home from my mission. And, um, I never stopped praying for, her and I never stopped thinking about her, um, along with many of the other people that I've taught on my mission. And, um, in August of, 20, 2014, so um, about mm, give or take seven months ago from now, um, I got a random message from her on Facebook um, uh, message, and so she was like, I'm on a read, I have news for you, and I was like, wait, what? And um, and I was kind of nervous, because even when we were teaching her, she was, um, she'd been fighting with, she's been fighting with cancer throughout her whole life. And, um, even when we were, te when I was teaching her, she had had a tumor, um, removed while I was teaching her. She had another tumor appear while I was teaching her. Um, and so to just receive, I have news for you. I was really nervous. Um, because more of the news that I've gotten from her had gotten from her had been not necessarily good news. And, and I was like, Oh, you do, huh? And she's like, yep, I got baptized yesterday morning. And I was like, wait, did I understand you right? Um, and she's like, yeah, I got baptized yesterday and I, I will be posting pictures. And I, um, she's like, but you can't tell anybody. I have to tell everybody. And I was like, okay. Um, which drove me crazy because I wanted to tell like the entire world. Um, so I decided I could tell anybody who didn't know her. So basically anybody who had nothing to do with the mission, um, I could tell them because <laughs> they didn't know her. So it was fine. Um, but it, it, killed me because I wanted to tell my companion who I, who I was together with when we first met Sophie. Um, but I guess my, and she, yeah, so she's now been baptized. She's a strong member and going strong and she goes and helps the missionaries, um, all the time. I guess my biggest message or the, the reason I wanted to share this message, um, in this story is because Everybody, um, you are supposed to meet people for a reason, and I don't know why I couldn't have been the person teaching her when she decided to get baptized. And I'm sure the first sisters that met her at this point 15 years ago <laughs> would probably say the same thing. Um, but what I do know is that the Lord knows each of us perfectly, and... Um, and we each have our time and our moment and, and we have to go by the Lord's timing and not by our personal timing. Um, and so my message, I guess for you, for, for everybody, um, is that every person you come in contact with is for a reason. And, um, and maybe that reason is just, to help them along the way. Maybe that reason is just to be the first interaction that they have with somebody who's a member of the church or the first interaction they have with the missionaries. Um, or be it they need help in a specific area and you're able to give that help in that area. Um, and maybe they won't join the church when you're there. And maybe they won't join the church for three years, four years, 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years. Um, but the fact is that we have an influence on people and especially as missionaries, um, as long as you teach one from the heart, but more specifically by the spirit, 
um, and to the needs of the people you're teaching, you will have that important and that, that influence on them that they're needing. Um, and maybe they won't realize it in the moment and nor will you. Um, but that will be there regardless. Um, and I can promise you that you will have special stories and special moments and special people that you teach, um, be they members or not, um, that, that not only will you be able to help, but they in turn will be able to help you. Um, Sophie is somebody who is very dear and dear to my heart and, um, is a very special person. And I know that she's going to do great things. Um, one, she's already done great things in my life by, by being an example to me. And um, the Spirit and the Lord, I guess you could say, truly do work in mysterious ways. <laughs> and um, But He knows us, and He knows us perfectly. And He knows why you need to be a companion with who you need to be with, be it a companion that maybe you have to work through some obstacles with, be it a companion you don't necessarily get along with, be it a companion you get along with, great, from the very get-go. Um, be it members that challenge you um, or give you a hard time because you can't speak the language even though you've been there for 18 months. Um, every, every moment and every minute is precious and um, in the time, in the moment, sometimes we can't see that, but in hindsight, we always have 20-20 vision. So. so I served in four areas, and I have special people in every one of my areas, um, but I have specific people in every area. Um, but the first one that's probably the closest to me is in my second area. Um, which is called baños, um, and no, it doesn't mean, well, yes, it means bathrooms, but here it actually means fountains. Um, the actual name of the city is Baños de Agua Santa, so it's fountains of holy water. Um, that is a very, very hard area, <laughs> um, more so because it's a very small town, and it's, um, it's a very high tourist location and so there's lots of tourists that come through there um, but because it's such a little town um, there's probably only I don't know I want to say maybe 5,000 people in the actual town itself um, there's a lot of little communities surrounding it um, but the town itself um, there's probably only about 5,000 people and in addition to that <laughs> um, in this tiny town there's probably, I want to say there was at least 15 churches. <laughs> um, I remember me and my companion counting them one day. Um, and it made things really challenging because almost everybody you ran into have either heard of you or heard, know somebody who is a member or anything and everything. Um, the Catholic Church is very large and very strong in Ecuador, um, and so you run into a lot of opposition in that area, in that aspect by itself. Um, and I feel like I ran into it more so in Baños too, because they have their own, they have their own virgin, um, um, Mary, and so we get a lot of the opposition in regards to that, um, because they'd always bring up. Mary in every conversation that we had with people and so just be prepared for that as well but um so this town 15 churches in probably I don't know maybe a five mile radius um of each other and um I'd been there for probably roughly like a week week and a half um with my companion and um, the weather had been beautiful and we wake up this one morning and it was downpouring. <laughs> um, and so we got up, we got ready, we went through studies and all that, all that fun stuff. And we left for the day 
And both of us were very optimistic. Um, we said our prayer, we had a companionship prayer before we left. And we both felt very, very optimistic about this day. And um, so we set off. We had an area of the city that we were determined we were going to contact every door um, in that area. And and so we, we set off to go that direction, which included having to climb a hill to get there. And so we knocked on, I don't know how many doors, um, but we were getting nowhere. Either people weren't answering or they'd answer. And the second we'd introduce ourselves, they'd be like, nope. And they'd slam the door in our face. Um, and so we were kind of losing our optimism and we were kind of getting discouraged. And we were coming back down the hill and we we're kind of, um, we had knocked on a door. We had gotten nothing. We passed, we crossed the street, we went down, we went down more on the hill. We knocked on a door um, and had a little tiny dog come running out after us. That was fun. Um, and we were going to keep going. We didn't get anything there either. And we were going to keep going down the hill. And my companion was like, I feel like we should go back up to that street because there was a house right on the corner. And so we're like, okay. So we went back up and um, there was a big gate, like a um, chain link fence gate. Um, right there and um, there was a, a young girl in the in the patio area she was she looked like she's probably 10 11 um, and so we called out to her um, and we just kind of we kind of introduced or we kind of talked to her for a second and we we're like hey is your mom home and um, and she's like she's like maybe I'll go check which is a typical answer that you also get um, and so as she turned to go inside, she slipped and, um, and she fell and she fell like right into a puddle of water. And, um, both of me and my companion were like, Oh, are you okay? And, and whatnot. But because of all the commotion and she just started laughing. And so we're like, okay, apparently she's okay. And, um, and all the commotion her, it, it caused her mom to come outside and, um, and so we started talking to her mom and, um, it was the, the familia, the Aymara family. Um, and this mom is a hero <laughs> and a, a, I don't know, spiritual giant in my eyes, I guess you could say. Um, she, when we met her, she was 28, um, and she had five kids. Um, she was a single mom. Um, her The daughter was the oldest, so she had five kids all underneath the age of 11. Um, and the youngest was about six or seven months old. Um, and so this family became very, very special to me and my companion. And um, we taught them. And um, the, the daughter, Estefania, um, she was gung-ho about reading the Book of Mormon. We would come every lesson. She had read it. She could tell us exactly what the, what the reading was about, the, the assigned reading and, and whatnot. And, um, and there was multiple times where she was like, I know that this book is true. Um, she was most definitely the first person in the family that was like, yeah, I know it. And, um, and we're like, oh, that's awesome. And so we continued teaching them. Um, we invited them to be baptized and Estefania was like, no, I don't want to be baptized. Um, and we're like, wait, why, <laughs> you know, it's true. Like why? Um, and she explained she was planning, she was preparing to be baptized in another church and she had a lot of friends in that church and she didn't want, she's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going with them. And, and so, um, we, talk to her to find out how we could help, um, what's going on, tried to get her to know kids of her age in the, in the branch. And, um, she came to church many times, but she, in the end, she still was like, Nope, don't want anything to do with it. And I was like, okay. Um, but her mom, um, and, and her brother, they, they were, they were still good. And they, they, they were like, no, we want to be baptized. And we're like, okay. And, um, the day of the baptism, um, it was, it was Mother's Day weekend. <laughs> and, um, and so me and my companion 
had talked with, we were talking with our parents. So we, we made plans with the family to make sure that we're like, you need to be at the, at the church at this time. And you need us to come by and pick you up and all that. And she was like, no, no, we'll be there. And I was like, okay. So me and my companion, we went, we, um, cause we met up with her before and then before we went to talk with our families. And so then we went and we called our families and we talked with our families and, um, and then we went down to the church um, because for for the baptism, and we got to the church, and um, the elders were there um, that were going to perform the baptism, and um, and they're like they're like where where are they? Where's the family? And we're like wait, they were supposed to be here already because we were kind of running behind, and. Um, and they're like, well, they're not here, obviously. And this family didn't have a phone, so there wasn't a way we could just call them. Um, you had to go to their house to get them because they were very, very poor um, to, to contact them. And so the district leader and his companion, um, they, they're they like, okay, we'll go and get them. So they called down, a, they get, got a taxi, and they drove up there. And um, they they got her and her and her family and they brought them back to the church and um and then the baptism occurred um estefania was there but she she supported her mom and her brother but she was still she's like no i don't want to get baptized and we're like okay and um shortly so after the baptism we were we were meeting with them because they um and asking how things were and um Mom, she she told us that she was ready to run away the night of her baptism. Um, that she's like, you, you, your sisters, you came, you you met with me before um, on that on that Saturday, and and I was gung ho and I was ready to get baptized. And then you guys left, and um, as the time got closer, I. Um, had I had every motivation to go out my gate and walk in the opposite direction of the church, because um, she was kind of just up the up the street um, a ways, but she was straight up the street from the church, and so she's like, I was gonna walk the other direction and um, and basically just hide from you, and and she's like, I walked out of my out of my bedroom because in their house there was four different rooms, but they were all separated, and so you had to walk into the courtyard to go into every room. And so she's like, I walked out of my bedroom and I was ready to walk out that gate, and then I decided, all of a sudden I was like, oh, I need to get something out of the the kitchen, and she has no idea why she went into the kitchen. Um, but the second she walked, like, she'd been in the kitchen for a couple minutes when she heard a knock on the gate, and it was the elders. Um, and and she knows that she was supposed to go to the kitchen because she would have not been there if if she hadn't. She would have been gone, and they wouldn't have been able to track her down. Um, but since her baptism, um, she has been a very stalwart member and has been very involved um, in the branch. And um, I unfortunately don't get to contact her very often, but I'm able to stay in contact with people from the branch. What I would want to say to anybody who got, is called um, to the Quito Ecuador mission, um, be it the Ecuador nor or Quito North or Quito South, um, is uh, first off, you are called to where you need to be. Um, I most definitely learned that on my mission. Um, that every missionary is going to say that their mission is the best in the whole wide world. And one, that's true. Um, but not in the sense of one mission is better than another, but because your mission is for you. And, um, and really you gotta, you gotta take all that you can. Um, don't, don't miss an opportunity. Um, the Lord has people prepared. And the people of Ecuador <laughs> are amazing. Um, they're very humble and very, very, very warm and welcoming. Um, and the mission's not about baptisms. The mission's not about numbers. 
there's times where that might come in and you might think that that's the case, but, but truthfully, that's not the point of the mission. Um, don't, the, the point of the mission is, is exactly what the missionary purpose is, and that is to bring others unto Christ. And yes, continuing that, it, it goes through the process of the gospel, but the key element of the purpose of your mission is to bring others unto Christ. And um, you, you have been called to a very special place, um, in my opinion. <laughs> and um, the, mission, the mission will change you. Um, you have every right to be kind of nervous, kind of scared kind of anxious, um, whatever other feelings might be coming through your mind, um, excited. Um, I remember I was really excited. Um, but I do know that the Lord loves each and every one of us and he knows us perfectly. Um, he knows us individually and he knows the people to whom we need to be, to associate with and to become, come in contact with. Um, that your companions, the, the other missionaries in the mission field, um, your mission president, his wife, um, any of the senior couples, um, they're all going to be influential, but even more so, um, you will be changed. The mission changes you. Um, and the conversion process, as important as it is for, for those that you teach and those that you come in contact with, um, the conversion process is even more important for you. And um, my, my mission scripture um, was Alma 929. And um, to summarize it, I don't have it completely memorized, but to summarize it, um, paraphrase it, is... To that to not glory in in the glory goes to God and the glory and the gratitude to be an instrument in his hands um, to bring in order to bring be it one person um, unto unto Christ and there were many times in my mission that I felt like that one person was myself however as I brought myself and as I came closer to Christ, it was inevitable that I was going to bring others unto Christ. And um, it was inevitable that a change um, was going to happen. And um, we, we are people of habit. <laughs> and um, my, my advice, my, my message to you would probably be, be the best you can be now. And put the Lord first in all your doings. And I've had many people tell me throughout my life um, that that the MTC is a training grounds for your mission and your mission is a training grounds for your life. And when I heard that before my mission, I probably was like, yeah, you're crazy. Um, however, I probably would have to say the same thing. Um, and the cliche that the mission is the best two years, or for us sisters, the best 18 months of my life. Um, I honestly can say that that's true. Um, doesn't mean it's not hard. Um, doesn't mean that there won't be days you don't want to be there um, and you're ready to give it up. Um, but when those moments come, I guess the biggest, the biggest message, the biggest lesson that you can take from it is... Um, one, you're not there for you. You're there for the Lord. And you're, you're His mouthpiece. Um, and yes, we're not perfect people. But the gospel, um, the gospel is for everybody, regardless. And um, I would say make the most out of your mission. Um, and... Even in those hard times, try to look for the little bit of sunshine that will be there. Um, I, looking back, I can't, I sure I know about my bad times, but that's not what I focus on. I focus on the good things and the lessons that I learned from those tough times. 
um, and be the best, like I said, be the best you can be, um, be obedient, be humble, um, and remember that, that you're representing the Lord all the time and that people are always watching.